So today I have Pete Jacobs with me on the podcast, one of the very few men that I've had on and certainly the fittest person that I've chatted to on the podcast. So welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Um, And I love my guests to sort of describe um, their story in their own words. So can you tell everyone a little bit about you and what you do? Well, I am a professional triathlete and I have been for about 20 years. I'm now 38. Um, But when I was a teenager, so about 15 years of age, I started getting a bit of fatigue and issues like that, not being able to concentrate. Um, Every now and then a training session, I just couldn't even push myself to get my heart rate up. And I basically just learned to deal with that through my 20s. So I would learn to back off, train less, have some rests that was basically forced rests, Um, But my goal became in my early 20s, my goal was to win the Hawaii Ironman World Championships. So those that don't know, that's 3.8 kilometre swim, 180 kilometre bike ride followed by a marathon. And the world champs are held on the big island of Hawaii every year in October. So that became my goal. And I managed my fatigue and ego and all of that. And it took me 10 years. And then I did win it when I was 30 years old. So... I then, I was 30 years old, I'd done about 35 Ironmans at that point and my body, instead of maybe a day to a week of fatigue, and that fatigue was like depression, Um, my skin was really bad, like seborrheic dermatitis type issues, Uh, my guts had been bad since the early 20s, so really no consistency in uh, toilet stops or anything, and so I had a whole range of symptoms besides just the fatigue. But it would kind of the, the worst fatigue and inflammation and depression would kind of be like a day to a week. But then once I turned 30, it became more like a month to two months. And then because of the issue of mus- muscles not working well, they're not getting the oxygen they need that goes along with all the issues of inflammation, I would get more injuries. So a lot of pain, sort of one side of my back was sore and I'd have like six weeks where I could train really well and I'd be like, I can still do this. I can still be world champ again. But then I'd be in a hole for like, you know, two months and basically went through that cycle for about five years and then realized in 20, end of 2017 that I couldn't keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'd tried a few things. I'd spoken with Dr. Phil Maffetone, who a lot of people know, Um, he's an absolute guru for for since the 70s around health and fitness and he was kind enough to give me time and, and advice and so I improved a little bit that kind of got me through to 2017 but no huge changes in terms of on race day I wasn't able to perform so I was like okay I need to take 2018 completely off until I figure this out because it, it was never about my career it was always about it if I can't figure this out I can't be like a a great husband that I want to be. And if I become a father, then I can't be a good dad because I I literally just feel depressed for months at a time. And I want to be able to enjoy exercise. And when that fatigue hits, it's, I don't want to do anything. I I didn't want to go surfing, walk the dogs, nothing had joy. It was just complete brain fog. Um, so did you ever did you ever get a diagnosis? Like was yeah, this never a diagnosis, but obviously wow. attempted diagnosis many, many times since I was mm. a teenager. Mm. All the usual stuff which I now realise was mostly just um, you know, smoke and mirrors and, and totally focused on the wrong issues. Mm. Um but then 20, 2018 I took off and I got a little bit better and by that point I'm full keto. Um but Towards the end of 2018, I started to realize and heard that just being keto didn't mean I needed to fear protein. I could eat protein and I'd still be in ketosis. So I upped my protein. And at the same time, I heard that a lot of people with IBS issues are actually much better off with low fiber. So then it became, okay, high protein, low fiber, basically going towards carnivore. So that start of 2019, Um, I then chatted to Dr. Paul Mason, who a lot of your listeners probably know as well through low carb down under. And he gave me the, the advice and the confidence to go strict to carnivore. And I noticed improvements continually. Um, but every now and then I was still having, um, recurring issues of a little bit of fatigue, a little bit of my skin issues. 
And I couldn't figure it out because I'm on meat, fish and eggs. Like there wasn't a lot of variables. And then I came across histamine as a potential issue. So then I went low histamine for a while. Um, and, you know, I would still occasionally also fall back into having some dairy um, because it, meat, fish and eggs, I'd be really great and I'd do it. But if there's something in front of me, if I'm at a party, if I'm out and somebody else has put it there, it's like, oh, yeah, I'd love to taste what's there. And, oh, we've got some cream left over. I'll just have some cream and see if I'm – see if maybe now I'm okay with cream. Anyway, I'm at the point now where dairy is like just 100% off limits. I don't touch dairy. But I also have improved my gut. So going carnivore – was really good for me that I couldn't even tolerate a high fat diet at that point. Like if I had a lot of fat with my meat, it would go straight through me. So now here we are in, uh, you know, the start of 2020 and I'm, my guts are very tolerant of everything. So I've, I've healed my histamine issues. I've healed my, my gut issues. I've healed everything. And the moral of the story is that none of it was, a like none of it was about performance enhancing it was not about my career so i'm trying to tell everybody that no matter who you are you would do the same things if you had my issues and i'd do the same things even if i wasn't a professional athlete and the other key element is that none of the little things that i was focused on mattered it was about healing everything at a cellular level which i'm still um doing which is still a working process but the point is that the gut fixed itself, that the histamine fixed itself, because all of these issues are related to cells and the cellular health and the ability of the cells to how they respond to things, um, how robust they are, how much energy they're producing, oxygen that they're able to process, all of that kind of stuff. So I've been able to get, and this has taken years of listening to hours and hours and hours of podcasts, um, I'm now at the point where I'm very much focused on the mitochondria and cellular level of things. And that is how I was able to heal. It had nothing to do with, yes, cutting out lectins and oxalates would have helped my gut give it a break, definitely, because as I said, it just couldn't handle a lot of stuff. So that o ongoing autoimmune reaction was obviously preventative when you're trying to turn over and produce new cells in a healthy environment that can't really happen if you're always in a chronically inflamed environment so there's there's layers to it um, that took time but at the end of it it came back to what I'm focused on now is um, just the cellular health now that the gut's looking after itself I'm able to eat fruit that's in season now and I'm loving it I'm eating some pumpkin and loving it um, so, I mean, but I'm training hours and hours a day. You know, I run 100 kilometers a week. So in terms of the, your listeners that are thinking of carbohydrates and things like that, um, you know, my body is incredibly insulin sensitive now, which it wasn't years ago. I did have fluctuations in my blood sugar levels. I tracked ketones. I tracked blood sugar. I did all of that stuff, which was really interesting at the time. Um, but now... Um, in a healthy environment, that just doesn't matter as much mm. as what you're eating matters. So I don't touch anything processed. Um, you know, the most processed it gets is ghee. And that's my one little dairy thing that I have. But it's not really dairy because it's so mm. there's no protein in it. Mm. Um, it's just the pure fats and, and you really can't get much inflammatory properties of anything into the fats. So I only use a little bit of ghee into my coffees because I whiz it up um, and just have a tiny bit of ghee and coffee. But um, yeah, so long story that I'm wow. now fully focused on the cellular health and that, um, you know, and that's got a long, that itself has a, has a whole nother story to tell in the, in the coming weeks, months and years as well. That's amazing. So there's a lot in that and there's probably a lot of people listening going, uh, what fibre? and carbohydrate what you know because there is still you know obviously so much uh, out there around yes fiber is essential healthy whole grains um if you're exercising you have to have your carbs i mean i was a personal trainer for 10 years i've told so many people you know mm. hand on heart i just didn't know but 
you know, I've given them a lots of the wrong advice over the years. But, you know, sometimes I think the world that I live in is a little bubble because if you move outside it, there's still so much misinformation out there around that. Now, your story is just so unique um, in terms in terms of how you, you know, what you did to figure things out. I mean, do you, essentially, what's the deal with the fibre? Let's start with the fibre. So, was it till it wasn't until you sort of came across Dr. Paul Mason that you sort of started to see, well, maybe that's causing me more problems than it's, you know, than well, it's probably at. <laughs> probably a couple of months before that when I heard on a podcast that IBS could be better off without fiber and that protein wasn't going to take me out of ketosis. So they were yeah. the kind of key elements that I heard right at the same week of listening to podcasts, and I started doing it, and then. Um, I spoke to Paul in early January and he sort of said, we'll go full carnival. So at that point I was still having, you know, cacao powder, coconut cream and an occasional bit of, you know, fiber from the occasional bit of um, veggies. But the, I mean, cacao as well can be a huge inflammatory thing for, for people that have sensitive guts. So, and coffee as well. So I've, I've gone months and months without coffee um and now i just do it because i enjoy it i don't some for training i do sometimes use it because i think oh i think i need a little stimulation for my brain um so that's that's another fascinating part of my journey is exercising as you mentioned and you everybody's told you that you need carbohydrates to exercise um so going full carnivore and being really really strict for for, for several months but still trying to train quite a lot I, I was really scratching my head on, I, I know I don't need the carbohydrates, but I need to figure out why, because mm. I, that's my personality. And that's what's led me to not give in to the issues that I've had for 20 years. And no, I know I can figure this out. I've got to figure it out. Um, so it took many, many, many different avenues, different podcasts, different people. Um, but yeah, basically figuring out what energy actually is, which is the little mitochondria producing ATP and then the ATP being produced in an environment that it is abundant in of, you know, vitamins, minerals, water, um, oxygen, and basically low inflammatory state of oxidative stress. So if you've got a lot of free radicals because of inflammation, of you've, you've trained too hard, you've eaten bad foods, you've burnt too much sugars, um, then that can inhibit further ATP production. So you're actually going to potentially produce less ATP the more sugars that you eat because um, fat is a more cleaner fuel. It's less oxidative stress when you're burning fat than you know when you're burning sugar. So it became a, a, a very simple equation of, oh, okay, well, if I just don't focus on anything to do with fuel. I'm, I'm already a very good fat burner. I need to now focus on optimal production through this electrical process of ions, positive and negative ions within, because the ATP is kind of produced as ions flow in and out of the cell of the mitochondria. And then, so all those bits help connect and produce electrical current within the mitochondria, which produces ATP. So, that's where, okay, well, energy matters in terms of an electrical current. So now I'm very much on board and really I, I've listened to podcasts about lightning and the magnetism of the earth. Like those are the different avenues that now when you start to try and learn about what is energy and energy has nothing to do with how many carbohydrates you eat, um, understanding how we evolve from billions of years, we are... 100% evolved alongside the magnetism of the earth, the energy from the sunlight, um, the UV rays, and, um, you know, and the minerals and vitamins that create that current ability as well. So, you know, we're all told we need electrolytes for, um, you know, hydration and energy. And, and that's now I see it's truer more than ever that the sodium, potassium, magnesium, the electron chain transponders and the production of ATP. If you're low, if you're really, really low in sodium, you will feel terrible yeah. because you literally don't have one side of that electrical current to produce 
ATP. So there's. I thought you were going to tell layers. me there for a second that you'd found out we didn't need it because I'm like, oh, geez. Because I, yeah, a hundred percent. You know, to me, it's one of the areas that I think, you know, is a big barrier for people. They don't understand. You know, they might change their diet, get rid of stuff. Oh, I'm still really tired, and then they're really low in all of that stuff. And it is because it is essential to that production of energy, as you said, amazing. Yeah, so, I mean, and now I'm just fascinated with how the Mm. universe works. And that's, if you want to delve really, really deep, as I now really enjoy, learning about how the universe was created and learning about what lightning does and learning about what Wi-Fi does and EMFs, you know, non-native EMFs, the electromagnetic frequencies and radio waves from all our Wi-Fi, our cell towers. Mm, mm. That stuff definitely affects the current that we're trying to balance out within our bodies. So that's too much of the positive side of things. So positive charge within our body we get from all this non-native electrical and magnetic frequencies that are not balanced with the earth that we evolved over billions of years with. Um, and so to balance that out with more negative charge, the earth has more negative charge. So grounding, so walking barefoot, jumping in the ocean, spending time actually touching the earth uh, is much more important now than I ever, you know, I used to think it was woo woo just a couple of years ago. Mm. And now that you, you know, it, it's, it's hard to believe that it's not a bit woo woo, but until you kind of delve into what's actually happening in our cells to produce mm. energy mm. Um, and realize that, oh, it is an electrical current in there, then, then it starts to make sense. Okay, there's an electrical current that we need to balance out just like a battery with a positive and negative end. We need to balance out that. So obviously, you know, there's, there's many podcasts that go into all the things you can do to avoid um, the non-native EMFs. Mm. Um, and, you know, I guess there's also other avenues of how to balance oxidative stress as well. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm um, getting delivery of a hydrogen machine so I can actually breathe molecular hydrogen. So the hydrogen helps balance out that oxidative free radicals. Wow. Um, and then also a, um, a grounding sheet and pillow so that when I sleep, I will actually be grounded through to the earth so that any or a lot of those frequencies that are hitting me throughout the night, um, I'll actually be able to kind of balance out because I'm connected to the earth. So uh, it's one of those things where, yes, you're just spending time grounded while you're sleeping. So it's a bit of a, a cheat and a, and a really, really easy way to get um, some easy, simple time grounded and balance out that negative charge. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 100%. I haven't tried them yet, but I know that, that is going to make a big difference on my recovery each night. Um, for me, I've always been more sensitive and, and so is my mum. And so this is where the story kind of I can relate to all the other women out there um, that are just having fatigue issues who aren't going for optimum performance and training 20 hours a week. But just, just getting through uh, the day. <laughs> just getting through the day. So yeah. my mum and I actually have really similar symptoms. So... My mum, however, being, um, you know, 35, 30 something years older than me. Um, so she had diagnosed with um, really high blood pressure when I was just about to be born. So she was hospitalized for a couple of weeks. And from that point, she's been on lots of high blood pressure medications. Um, so then you added in things that her mitochondria were genetically probably more fragile and I've in and I and I've also got her mitochondria because the mitochondria are passed from mother to child whereas the mitochondria don't come from the father so okay. it's no surprise I've got my very similar issues to my mum mm. because these are mitochondria issues and so then my mum got polymyalgia about 15 years ago so been on prednisone for a long time since um, then she got giant cell arteritis um, a couple of years ago um, and she's been on carnivore since the same time as me and she's seen Dr. Paul Mason. Um, but because her issues are worse and she's on all this medication and has been for decades, um, you know, it took me, you know, best part of a year to really start to feel the energy and the, 
the cells have turned over enough into new cells in a in a low inflammatory environment that the signaling is now I'm more robust now. Whereas for mum, it's taking longer. So she's still having a few little setbacks. Her CRP is still going up occasionally. She has a more stressful life than I do dealing with her aged mum. Um, and I haven't yet convinced her that she just has to completely avoid the blue light at night. She's, she's close. She's, she's getting to that point for her because circadian rhythm, cortisol, that's a huge thing for her, a problem for her because she doesn't sleep well at night. Partly the drugs that she's on. Mm. And partly that um, her system is still more messed up than mine. Um, and so Cadian rhythm of hormones is a huge factor that, that I've really had to take note of. Like I've known for a decade that a late night will mess me up for days. Mm. Um, I've just, I've been saying it for a long time, but only now do I realize why, because, you know, that input of bright light at nighttime will mm. screw my hormones up for the next, you know, few sleep cycles. So my mum, for example, you know, she, she's feeling, when she feels a bit better, oh, she might stay up a little bit later. Mm. The tennis is on. She's watching the tennis, which is like a blue court. It's a bright TV. Like you can't get any bluer light. And so her body is getting a signal that it's daylight, even though it might only be twilight and it might only be 7.30 um, where she is and it's still kind of light outside, her body's getting the signal that it's midday because it's such a blue light that that really spectrum only exists around midday. So when the sun is at its highest, the rest of the time, you know, morning, evening, you're getting a really broad spectrum of all the colors and a lot more red light and things like that. So, and the circadian rhythm is going to set to the input that it gets. It can't set any other way except from input. The input you can get from grounding, so the magnetism of the earth changes throughout the day. So grounding is a really good way to improve circadian rhythm and hormones. Um, but mostly it's the TV, the phone, the, ele the, the lights on our ceilings. Yeah. Any of that stuff is going to really affect hormonal health. And for, for people that are fragile like myself, like my mum and a lot of other people out there, um, until you take care of these obvious huge factors that influence your hormonal cycle then you're not going to get deep sleep so you're not going to get that repair and recovery during sleep which is mm -hmm. we all know sleep's important but it's not so much about oh i need good sleep it's no you the reason you will get good sleep is because you're doing this other stuff when you're awake so it's not really don't focus on the sleep focus on what you're doing when you're awake mm -hmm. and then the sleep will look after itself um, and, you know, electricity has only been around, you know, uh, 150 years or something. So before that, and then even, even it's only probably been LED lights have only been around, you know, 30 years or something. Before that, incandescent bulbs were much dimmer. So, and TVs were definitely dimmer. They were smaller. They were dimmer. They weren't even in colour for the first, you know, decade oh, know. or so of existence. So. Uh, you've got to look at and think about spectrum of light that's hitting you and influencing your hormonal rhythm, which will influence the ability for your mitochondria to produce energy. So there's, there's many, many layers. Amazing. And, I mean, look how we were, how many, what, only a few hundred years ago, I mean, it was campfire. That was it. That was kind of what the only light we got. And as soon as it went dark, you know, the signal was to sleep and, all this stuff, you know, and what I like about what you're talking about is that you're looking at ways to overcome it because I think we get a little, we get really caught up and anxious in oh, all this stuff going on. What can we do? What can we do? Well, we can't change it. You know, we can't change the fact that this is the world now, but we can certainly look at our life and, and see how, you know, um, not everyone's probably as sensitive as you are. Mm. But a lot of people don't realise that that could be an issue either for themselves. But what are the things that you can do within your realm, within your life, that's easy enough just to help with your body sort of adjusting to all of that? Yeah. And I think I think I saw Chris Cresser only today uh, posted something on all this stuff you're talking about with electromagnetic radiation. And, you know, we've got 5G. That's the next mm. big thing coming. And we were talking to the, we had NBN, had to get it installed the other day, otherwise we were going to be cut off. And the guy was saying that that's 5G only has a small 
something like a, a small radius or something. It has to be on virtually every pole. Yeah. And I'm like, what? I mean, wow, there is there is so much going on and it's going so fast. And, you know, it, a lot of it is out of our control, but what we can mm. control is just, you know, the little things like you're talking about. Yeah, and a lot of people um, that I'm learning from, yeah, they're very – they're warning everybody about 5G. So it's up mm. there on some people's radars as the biggest health influencer in, in the coming years. Um, so for those that live in major cities, particularly where it's going to be really strong signal all the time, um, yeah, it's hard. There are ways to mitigate it. But mm. if we're just going to talk about the things that I've mentioned, if, if, if everybody thinks, oh, that sounds extreme, some of that stuff, it's like, well, it wasn't extreme just 100 years ago because this stuff didn't exist 100 years ago. To, so it's not extreme to try it for like two weeks to, to, to minimize, well, to cut out all processed foods for starters. Mm. Um, and for that, obviously, the thing that you should cut out forever is vegetable oils because they're highly oxidized, highly processed, not natural whatsoever. And a big part of the food that we eat, we, we actually take in information from that food. So at a cellular level, this in, the food carries information. So again, another thing that if I'd heard a, a year ago, I'd, I couldn't have fathomed and understood. Um, uh, but yes, it, it carries information through the water, the, the atoms in it, the, you know, the whole periodic table of elements. Um, they're, they're just everything that exists is on the periodic table of elements and yet we can't eat the periodic table of elements we have to eat things that have life that mm. exist in a living form but if you take up one end of that is you know grass-fed beef you know natural high nutrition it provides it's been out in the sun all the time it's taken on information because we also are emitting light all the time. Infrared, infrared light is stored within our cells as well. We store light, we store water. Those things carry information. So, so does the cow that we eat. It carries information of its environment, of water, of light, and other information in those cells because it's not just, as I said, it's not just the periodic table of elements. There is actual other things going on there that mm. give it life. So as you go towards the other end of the scale where you would just be literally eating a spoonful of iron shavings, you know. So somewhere in the middle, there are things like oxidized vegetable oils, um, which are not certainly don't have the life and the information of something natural. Um, it doesn't have the nutrition that we need. It doesn't have it in a form of fat that we can actually it, it's pro-inflammatory, the fat, for example, it's oxidized. So oxidized means um, that it has taken on extra oxygen and um, byproducts because it's not a saturated fat. And so it's been treated in heat. It's been treated with chemicals. Yeah. So you're taking on a lot of chemicals. It doesn't come from a vegetable. People probably don't realize that either. Basic number one, it doesn't come from a vegetable. No. So... <laughs> yeah. So many reasons to never yeah. eat vegetable oils. Um, mm. And so you think of that, there's a sliding scale of real food to not real food um, and try and just really eat way up the end of real food and you're going to be healthier. It, it's mm. just that simple that your cells will be able to process it, take it in, use it. So even that goes for um, you know anything that's really been processed and a lot of that stuff is all the same food. Like it's all from seeds, it's all from corn or it's all from the same plant. Um, so, yeah, it just doesn't have a, an abundance of information that's going to feed your body life and energy and the ability to, um, for you to take information that you're in a healthy environment. It's like you're, if you stand in the middle of a busy street breathing these toxins from the car fumes all the time, we all know that that's no good for us, mm. and yet it's something that happens all the time if we live in a city. Like, mm. you know, you're still getting that exposure. So there's things where you just try and do the best that you can. So eat as fresh and as natural food as you can means you're avoiding as much of that um, kind of non-native toxins and chemicals that you can. Um, but then so other things... Um, so if you were just to try for two weeks to live 
at what you would think is extreme, that just means you literally, as before the sun goes down, your phone is kind of on airplane mode and you don't look at it again. Um, unless you're wearing red glasses, which I do wear at night. If I need to look at my phone for something, I put on my red glasses, which block all the blue light um, and make everything red. Mm. So just avoid blue light is the key. You know, don't turn on your overhead lights. Go out to Bunnings and buy some red bulbs or buy online some red incandescent bulbs um, to use around a few lamps in your house so that when it gets dark, you're not getting that blue light. It's very kind of simple to do and try it for two weeks and see how you feel. Um, mm. And the other thing would be, um, yeah, so minimize processed foods for two weeks, or, or I should say cut completely processed foods. So that means you're cutting out all grains, all, you know, flours, wheats, glutens, um, snacks, no bars, no chips, no, none of that stuff, nothing processed. So even a hot chip that is highly processed because it's in the vegetable oils. Yeah. Um, so things like that just for, for a couple of weeks and you will notice straight away because um, Jamie and I run our, our health and performance coaching business. Um, one guy, before we hooked up, he, he sort of found me because he wants me to coach him for an Ironman triathlon. He's had a bad back and he's been seeing a chiro and a physio and mobility stretching guy like three times a week. He went carnivore um, recently. I think it's only been a couple of weeks. And his back is just so much better. So some people, the lectins and oxalates that are in plants, or it could be the glyphosate, the, you know, the Roundup poisons that sprayed on um, non-organic um, fruit and vegetables. It could just be the high amounts of, as I said, the lectins and oxalates in the things that you think are super healthy, like kale and spinach, mm, actually can be incredibly inflammatory for a lot of people. Yeah, like the, the, these plants are trying to protect themselves from from being eaten into extinction, so they have these inbuilt toxins that not a lot of people talk about. So, if you wanted to even try, if you have arthritis or IBS or something like that, it's very simple: e eat meat, fish, and eggs for two weeks, and I guarantee your symptoms will go down. And then you can try and introduce things that you like. Maybe you just oh, I still just want a little bit of fruit or a little bit of pumpkin. Um, but I think as soon as you, you'll, you'll notice when you reintroduce something that flares it up that you shouldn't have, whether it be the dairy, whether it be the, you know, the plants, you know, and not all plants, they're all got different levels of these issues. Um, I met one bloke the other day whose wife has, has migraines and so they were on the FODMAP diet and I'm thinking FODMAP, like, yeah, it's, it's gonna, your IBS might get a little bit better, but it's not going to cause if, if you do have gut issues and you're trying to fix it with food, you need to go back to the ultimate elimination diet, which is meat, fish and eggs, and then reintroduce some things. Um, you know, because, you know, FODMAP, you, and I said to him, the problem is if you try and restrict a little bit, your mindset is still very much focused on, oh, I still need to try and get five serves of vegetables and three of fruit every day. Mm -hmm. So, for you trying to restrict your, you know, 80% of your plate is incredibly difficult to do mentally. Whereas mm. if you flip the food pyramid upside down, um, you know, and you put meat, fish and vegetable, meat, fish and eggs at the top in, or at the bottom, I should say, in the bigger section, then suddenly, oh, my plate is 80% of this. Now it's very easy for me just to eat a few select pieces of fruit or vegetables mm. and it's very easy to then restrict the things that are either FODMAP or lectins and oxalates and stuff but trying to do little bits at a time works for some people but if you're if you've got like you know a more serious problem you want to get down to that really eliminated point you know fairly quickly um, mm. and for some people if you still obviously the other big factor of this is that you become a fat burner and for some people, they feel really terrible when they first cut out carbohydrates because their body has totally forgotten, hasn't done it since it was a baby, how to burn fat for, yeah. for energy. So yeah. your brain is going to send a signal that, oh, my God, my blood sugar is dropping. Therefore, I need, you know, sugar. 
and you're not going to be able to produce as energy as well in your cells for ATP. All of those processes take time. To get a little bit fat adapted enough that your brain is happy might only take a few days for some people. It might take two weeks. To get fully fat adapted for high performance exercise, it could take 18 months to, yeah. to really hit the optimal fat oxidization. But Which if you're back. training for like, you know, a, a race or something like that, I can see why that is a, you know, some people won't want to do that. You know, that's too long. You know, I'm going to miss out on 18 yeah, months of. A little bit. I mean, I think you can, you definitely can get a lot of very good benefits over that period and it will just keep improving. So I think you'll get back to where you were within a couple of months easily but then you will get better and better and better over the 18 months. So it won't be 18 months to get back to where you were. It'll be 18 months to get superhuman. Um, yeah, basically. But it might be 12 months and it might be two years. Uh, it all depends on, I guess, many factors of how healthy you were to start with, um, that your the adaptation process, how old you were, um, you know, and all those other medications and things like that. So... But basically, it's um, yeah. You can you'll you'll notice just to get over that um, bump of a few days of low blood. Your brain saying I've got low blood sugar. Um, yeah, you can easily just have a little, have a little you know quarter tablespoon of honey or something. You don't need much just to get your blood sugar up that tiny bit that it's going to be happy. Um, but if you go over, if you increase your blood sugar uh, above and beyond what is baseline then you're obviously going to shut down fat burning and you're not going to adapt at all, you know. So you need to minimize it, um, either go cold turkey and just be aware that it's going to just be a little bit, um, you know, you're going to be a bit hungry, hangry for a couple of days. Um, or And the other part of that is the sodium and potassium and magnesium really yeah. help in that period as well. Yeah. As I said, to produce energy, you need these things and those levels and the processes within mitochondria and how you produce energy, that all changes um, as you burn more fat. So you want to just assist those changes by keeping the minerals up as high as you can, um, yeah. keeping the fats up as high as you can. And then I do use, um, you know, coffee for the purpose of that the only – uh, reason that I feel as if I don't have energy is my brain telling me that I don't have energy or it is because I've got a lot of oxidative stress and I have trained hard the day before therefore my muscles are tired but in terms of your brain thinking that you don't have energy the only thing that exists is the perception of energy so caffeine works for the perception of energy um, other things that might help like um, nicotine gum or a spray um, other things might work like just the taste of sugar as I said a, a very small amount of sugar on the tongue or a, a sip of one sip of apple juice just mm -hmm. the taste of sugar in your mouth will or a bite of a piece of fruit can be enough that your brain goes oh okay I, I'm sensing sugar therefore I'm safe and you need to help it along as well if you build up anxiety around that you're feeling low energy, then it will build up and build up. So anxiety, your mindset, the ability to calm your mind when it senses low energy is a big part of it as well. So you can't just get, oh, the body and, and think it's separate to the mind. The mind influences the body and vice versa. So, um, yeah, so use, use coffee as needed, um, especially for that period of, of thinking that you're low on energy. Um, but yeah, once you become fat adapted, like I, this morning I ran 25 K this morning and I did it. I had a little bit of coffee this morning. Um, and then I came home and I've just eaten some, you know, slow cooked meat that I had cooking. Um, so I haven't had any sugars whatsoever. And like, I feel great because the exercise induces more fat burning, which, you know, increases my energy levels because it produces, um, like ketones uh, it gets my body oxygenated. So I'm feeling all the effects of exercise, but I haven't then had to go and have a whole heap of sugar because I'm having a sugar crash from exercising. So the other, <laughs> I think it's also interesting, and I don't have kids, so I can't speak entirely, but 
I have heard a lot of things and I know enough about how the body works that um, parents that think a kid is hyper after mm. they've had sugar is, is not really possible in terms of that they've got energy to burn. So having a high blood sugar for us or a child or whatever doesn't make them have more energy in terms of producing ATP or having, you know what I mean? Because energy, yeah. isn't, energy isn't produced. I mean, you don't produce ATP based on the supply of energy over fuel. Right. We've yep. always got fuel. They've always got fat to burn. They've always got sugar. We produce it through our liver, through burning fat. We produce sugars. You know, we've always got sugars. So what's more likely happening is that the same thing that happens when I have a bit of coffee or when somebody has something that they really enjoy, you get that dopamine hit. Makes you and happy. That, you, get, you get a dopamine hit and it makes you happy. Um, usually the kids, the, the parents are saying, oh, my God, they've had sugar. And it's usually at a party where the kids are like, you know, yes. they want to go mad. They're at a party yeah. because everybody is being hyperactive because they're all excited to be around each other. Um, and potentially it's just because they had the wrong types of food. They had processed food. They had lollies and they had, and they had you know, fruit juices, which, you know, um, highly processed and reduced ridiculous silly amount of sugars which can increase the blood sugar but then it will drop it later on as well and so you will get a kid really really cranky later on don't blame the sugar then it, the sugar was fine earlier it just gave them high blood sugar now you've got a low blood sugar that's the problem because they had the sugar earlier on but it's one of those things where the sugar when they've got high blood sugar my point is high blood sugar is not the problem to what the other problems are around it it's that it was processed foods it was colorings it was stuff that's made in a chemical factory i mean when you stop eating that stuff like i haven't eaten lollies and things forever when somebody opens up a bag of you know lollies or jelly beans i can smell it from a mile away yeah. because <laughs> the the scent that comes out of man-made Prod products is just ridiculous because it is chemicals mm. and only chemicals can have such a strong scent it, it's like eating perfume so there's no difference it is just a combination of the periodic table of elements that do not exist in nature and they've put them together into this lolly and they've done it to make it smell amazing like yeah i mean i don't think there'd be much difference to going and drinking a um you know perfume and, you know, you wouldn't go anywhere near that. But perfume, it's the exact same thing. Mm. It's, a, it's a certain combination of the periodic table of elements that does not exist in nature. And we've made it to create something that triggers our senses. The food that triggers kids to be addicted to it is the same thing. It's just a, a mismatched combination of the elements that exist in our planet. And it is been created to trigger those dopamine receptors, those addictive behaviors, those things that you would get if you had cocaine. Now, cocaine yeah. doesn't give you high blood sugar, but it certainly makes you a bit mad. So it, it's not really when people try and demonize the sugar in products, as much as I'm a low carb advocate um, and think, you know, it's, it's absolutely the better way to live. It's not the sugar that is the main problem within what people are eating when it comes to processed foods. Um, but obviously the sugar itself is so highly processed as well. It's not really a natural sugar, even though they all say on the packet natural sugars, it's so highly processed. But mm -hmm. I guess my point is it's not the high blood sugar that is the problem for a child. It is all the other stuff that their body's trying to process and is the reaction that they are getting from all that other stuff Mm. That the body is just like on a total drug sensory experience oh, from. Yeah. yeah. And that's, it, that's why it's, it's so hard to give it up too, you know. Like yeah. you, you see how generate in such a short number of generations, you know, what we're eating has changed so much. And the convenience of processed foods and, you know, all this stuff like, 
I don't know, it's really hard. I mean, I see it. I've got five kids and, you know, it is a constant battle, I guess, to have them live life too and enjoy parties with their mates, but understand too what's going on when they do eat processed food and I guess not fall trick to a, a trick mm. to it, you know, and what it's doing to it. But it is really hard. I mean, most of my work is helping predominantly women break these habits. So as a coach yourself, this mm. must be a big part of your work too. I mean, w- w- what's some of the, do you have some tips or what are the some of the re- things behind that? Like, how do you handle that? Um, it'd be a good question for Jamie. She, she talks a lot <laughs> to her clients about this stuff. I talk to my clients a bit about it as well. Um, you know, my, my clients that I work with are mostly on a triathlon program, so I'm training them to be fitter. But a lot of them all come from different food issues, whether um, they've had IBS and things like that, or some have had addictive personalities as well. The best way is to replace something. Um, so, you know, one of the guys was addicted to his fall back when he got really, really stressed was Coke. Um, And, you know, it was very much about having sparkling water on hand all the time when he starts to feel that the stress is coming up. Um, A a coffee, even if it's a full milk coffee, even if it's a latte, um, like I was like, it doesn't matter. It's going to give you the little bit of sugar. It's going to give you the caffeine. It's going to give you that dopamine hit of I'm enjoying this. So it comes back to have other things that make you feel comfortable and happy. Mm. So the guys that I train, it's very much like, well, if you're out and about and you feel like you need some energy, just get something that you enjoy because it's more about the dopamine hit than it is about the energy levels. Okay. Um, as you'll see, all the cyclists, you know, not all of them, but a lot of people will stop and they'll have a coffee and that's pretty much all they have on their training ride. But they feel great because they had that coffee and it was a break Mm. and it was a dopamine hit. They relaxed. Mm. So that's the other big key of it is when you have something that is a a habit and you tie that habit or that trigger to a mindset, then that's the trigger that, um, you know, creates the change. So the mindset change of so we I coach all my guys and I literally just wrote a little bit for them this morning saying three key steps that I want you guys to practice every day. And the first is when you're doing something habitual, like, you know, making a cup of tea or going for your daily run um, whatever, or going to the bathroom, whatever it is, have a place or a time that's a trigger for you to then be a zombie and totally blank your mind and think of nothing. And that includes being aware of the effort. So it's, it's quite hard to explain, but very quickly, there is no such thing as effort except for your perceived effort. Mm. Like, you know what I mean? The muscle isn't saying this is hard. Your brain is the only thing saying that this is hard. Yeah, yeah. So training yourself to disconnect from effort or stress or um, ego, which is, you know, oh, geez, I've, I've done this hard session, so now I am tired. Um, or I'm going to do this session soon, therefore, like, I'm feeling the stress of it already. Yeah. All that ego, future or um, past, that's the only place ego exists. So trying to get them a lot of disconnecting from ego, be 100% in the moment where nothing exists, not even effort. So you can go for your run, you can make dinner, you can walk around the house or whatever it is, but just for 30 seconds, do it with absolutely no awareness of the movement, the effort, where you are, what you're doing, and totally blank. It's like you're a zombie and you're totally bored. Um, and that's something that doesn't exist in this day and age very often, actually no. being bored and having a clear blank mind. Um, so that's something, 30 seconds, a few times a day while you're doing something that triggers it, three times a day would be awesome. Mm. And then the other one was just to when you're out running, actually stop and focus on something very close, like a leaf, so that your eyes are focused on one particular thing and you have to just focus your attention solely on one thing. So again, when you're doing this, you're also belly breathing. So you actually connect, you bring your awareness to one thing, but you're also bringing it within yourself as well. Mm. So you kind of learn to be aware of yourself while you're aware of something else. So again, 30 seconds, belly breathing, 
feel the shoulders relax, feel your mind relax, and just stay focused on that one thing. Um, and then the other is to then look at a view. And then your eyes are actually going to a landscape view and you're actually focused on nothing. So you actually then want to practice that your mind is out there with nothing in mind, nothing in view, and you're letting your eyes do the same thing. So you're getting that really visual feedback of what you're doing. So just mixing it up, what the brain is doing. So the leaf, it's just focused on a singular task, but you're relaxed while you're focusing on that singular task. The looking at a landscape view is, is giving your eyes a rest and letting your eyes have a greater um, perception and a greater um, view. So you're just relaxing your eyes. You also relax your brain with the same concept. Mm. Um, and then the other one is you're actually still doing something, moving, while you practice having no effort and no ego involved in that thing. So those things and becoming aware of your brain. And I mean, if you did those a few times a day, every day, it's crazy how strong you get at being able to trigger it. So that's what I do in training all the time. It's very much becoming aware of what I'm doing so I can do a systems check. Am, am I tensing my shoulders because I'm running harder? So I've got mm. to relax my shoulders. Am I, you know, my breathing getting stronger? Um, am I starting to talk about how far I've got left to run and that's making me tense up because I've still got, you know, another 10 Ks to go. So all of those things, if I'm practicing the others during the day, just for 30 seconds, that allows me when I catch myself thinking of ego or thinking of other things to bring myself back to this relaxed state of mind really, really quickly. And so you connect the mind and body relaxed state. The quicker you can get there and the more familiar you get with it, the stronger that connection gets between the brain. You know, the synapses become very quick to jump to that alternate awareness. And so you can go from being, you know, you, you'll catch yourself there, like shoulders up, phone here, reading, like, you know, you're looking down, necks tight. And then you'll just be like, oh, my God, like, what am I doing? Mm. And suddenly you just... You know, you you stand up tall with good posture and you might just stand there reading your phone with it more in front of you rather than bending down with your neck. And then you'll focus on belly breathing. And so things like that, you just, the more you practice being aware, mm. the more often you will become aware, the more, um, and then that relates to vagal tone, relates to the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system responses, um, which relates to you know, cortisol levels, which yeah. will relate to um, circadian rhythm. Mm. And, mm. you know, it goes around and around and around. So, mm. um, so that's the main triggers. Long answer to how do I work with the people to get them off those particular things? Um, it's, yeah, replacing habits with healthier habits mm. and then also becoming aware that they're not tensing their body um, when they should be relaxed and barely breathing. Mm. Well, I think, you know, that, that sort of stuff that you obviously have experience of with your training and what you go through. I mean, I look at that and just think, how on earth can you do it? But it, it's, you know, I said for most of the people listening, it is a marathon to get through the day because of this lack of awareness and because of the habits and this constant struggle that they've got with, you know, this stuff mm. going on in their head. So that's fantastic. And just little, little things, little things can break down to make big things big efforts and I think as I said before you know the overwhelm for people can be huge but I think you can break it down just to little things like that and start to see really big differences and yeah, yeah. Fantastic. And, fantastic and for your listeners I think driving a car is a perfect trigger so when you every maybe every time you get to a traffic light yeah you bring your awareness back to your belly breathing and realize oh was I actually just totally tensing up because I'm thinking about the 20 other things I have to do today yeah. which is stressing your body into this cortisol response, sympathetic nervous system response. Your breathing kind of gets tense. Whereas if you just have a trigger, like every time you get to a traffic light in the car, you quiet your mind and you belly breathe. Like it's hard because our minds are in control of us and our minds want to be distracted these days. No big, no big part of it is the phone this constant distraction nearby yeah. and ability yeah. to be distracted has trained our brains to become habitually distracted. Um, we don't live so in a environment, true. you know, with a view, you know, nobody sits there 
on their back porch looking out at their you know gardens these days and without their phone nearby them so you know those sort of mm. things of learning to be bored again is really mm. really important and a, a thing that I keep mentioning to our clients is just do what you do on holiday but do it when you're at home yeah so get up and see the sunrise walk around barefoot um, don't look at your phone so much um, don't watch tv you know, go to bed early, you know, and then and eat good food and enjoy yourself, read some books, like literally try to do what you do on holiday the rest of the time, because those things are the things that will really trigger health. Like they will trigger all those key elements. And that's why you feel so good when you're on holiday. It's not anything to do with like you can do that, all of those things while you're still at work and you will still feel just as blissful. Um, maybe not as blissful, but no, I believe you can. Good. I see that very much so because it does come down to a lot of this that we, yeah. you know, and we do have the ability to choose what we pay attention to, you know, when it comes to, you know, we may not be able to control what comes in, but you yeah. know, I think when you can see that and all those little things you're saying, you can experience the same joy in your everyday life as you do when you're on holiday. Yeah. Um, there's no decisions on holiday as well, and that's another yeah, big de yeah. decision fatigue is yeah. a real thing. Your brain just gets exhausted like any other muscle, and it just wants to be like done. And yet yeah. you come home and you're like, what picture will I put on Instagram? What Netflix show am I going to watch? You know, what other thing am I going to cook for the kids and this, that, and the other? Like, the more you can streamline your life with less decisions and less distractions, which are de decisions. Um, you know, that's going to take away a lot of that mm. anxiety as well because mm. you can literally just chill out. And I think even decisions of what radio station in the car because a crap song comes on and then you're like, oh, I've got to find a good song. Mm -hmm. Just have a podcast ready to go, like get yeah. into some good series, um, whether it's not health ones like this, but even if it's a story or a short story or history. I love history ones. Um mm. You know, there's a few interesting food history ones as well where you can, like, learn some interesting facts. And as yeah. I said, I've gone down the rabbit holes of learning how the universe works, the periodic table of elements and, like, stuff that has nothing – that I thought would have had nothing to do to relate to me as an athlete. But when you start listening and learning more and more and more, then you actually start to calm down more because you realise, like, you know, I, I just don't need to make these decisions anymore. I can just – you know, listen to something that calms me and it's it's much more relaxing. It's just health benefits all around. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting because I've actually started to enjoy having nothing on in the car. Mm, yeah. Like yeah. I drive my kids around a lot and I will have a podcast sometimes, but actually, you know, I'm like, and I, I'd never not have had the radio on in the car for, you know, most of my life until six, 12 months ago. And it's really nice too, just nothing, just sitting there and driving. <laughs> Anyway, I've probably got to let you go. It was such a great chat. You've shared so much. I would love to get um, some links from you, obviously, on how people can find you. Um, yep. You know, you, I know with your coaching, your live live your own fit um, business. Uh, and also, you know, if there's any links you have on where people can read, you know, on this electro radi radiation, some of them, you know, stuff you were talking about because, um, too, there's so much out there and I think sometimes we mm. can't find, you know, the good stuff to read so if you can pass on to me and i can share that stuff that would be awesome yeah absolutely i'm i guess i'm lucky that my job swimming uh well not swimming but riding and running i can listen to podcasts while i'm at work so i get through a lot of hours mm. um yeah so it's a great just easy way to learn so I'll and send, of course send through some names and links F thank you and of course you've got your own podcast which i i'm mm. sure um will have would have you know <laughs> heaps of great info. So thanks so much for your time. It's been great. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you.